So hi, um, my name is Gilberto Mosqueda. This is my first year here at UC San Diego. I just moved from the um, university at Buffalo where I was a professor for about eight years. And um, my research work is along the lines of earthquake uh, engineering. I'm a structural engineer um, focusing on how we, how we can better design structures to resist earthquake motions. And I'm gonna take perhaps a few uh, jumps in scale from uh, the previous talks where we're talking about you know, very little nanoscale stuff to going big and trying to test things at, uh, at a much larger uh, sizes. And these are buildings, bridges, and, and so forth. Um, but um, before I go there, I'll start with an introduction and I'll define what a seismically isolated building is along the way. Um, but I, I wanted to start with um, just kind of a refresher on you know, what we've seen in the last few years in terms of uh, earthquakes. And um, we haven't had one in the US, or at least a, a fairly strong one in the US in, in, a, in, in a few years. Perhaps the last one was, that was a, a very significant was in 1994 in Northridge. Um, but worldwide, if we look at Chile, we had this 8.8 .8 earthquake. A um, few buildings collapsed, and you know this earthquake is of interest to us because the Chilean codes are actually, you know, to some extent based on U.S. codes. So the, the construction is, is, you know, somewhat similar to what you would expect here in the U.S. in terms of modern construction. But caused quite a bit of damage. Um, you know, very few buildings failed. Um, few survived the earthquake, but had to be demolished because they were damaged. And the other thing I kind of want to focus on, in addition to the structure itself, is the contents of the building, all the non-structural systems, the architecture finishes, you know, the ceiling systems, the, the um, partition walls that are kind of meant to, you know, make the environment uh, pleasing, uh, but also, you know, to serve, serve the purpose, like all the equipment in this case, you know, uh, speakers, et cetera, uh, to, for the room to serve its purpose. So uh, buildings that survived, you know, had, you know, although the buildings stood, some were, had some structural damage, others were useless because of all the things in there were kind of thrown around. Um, we had, you know, followed with that in 2010 and, and 20, early 2011 with two earthquakes in uh, New Zealand. They weren't quite as strong, but now we had earthquakes that were fairly close to an urban region. And this is why we had such a significant amount of damage. And there we saw that, you know, masonry structures, which we know don't behave well in earthquakes, and you probably don't see too many of them in California for this reason. Um, uh, you know, they collapsed and it was no surprise, but still a lot of other buildings had non-structural damage. And get to probably one of the biggest events we had in recent times, and this is a, a Japan earthquake, which is a, a, a 9.0. And you know, there was a tsunami and a nuclear incident, but you know, I'm, I'm kind of put that aside. And if I look at, you know, what the earthquake shaking actually did, there was very little structural damage um, to buildings. But yet, you know, larger cities, even though they were far away from the epicenter, like Tokyo, and Sendai a little bit closer, it's north of Tokyo, still had a lot of, a lot of damage, even the areas that were not affected by a tsunami due to um, buildings, um, you know, the buildings that caught on fire, others that um, got kind of shaken up quite a bit and had damage. So when a building collapses, this is exactly the kind of thing we want to avoid as an earthquake engineer, because this is when people could die, right? So this is our objective, actually, to design buildings is for the building not to do this, right? But the challenge is we don't know what the next earthquake is gonna be like, so this is where you know, a lot of probability comes in, and, but this is what we want to avoid. Um, there are other buildings, these are from Chile, by the way. Um, there are other buildings that you, know, you may look at them after earthquakes. Some you might notice a slight tilt, others may seem fine, but then you go inside and you see stuff like this, right? And then you're out there looking at this building, then you get a little aftershock and then you run out. Um, but buildings like this are probably, probably have to be demolished, but they serve their purpose in the sense that people could walk out alive, right? So uh, from that point of view, um, you know, the building actually served this purpose. Earthquakes are very rare events, or they're considered rare events, so um, we kind of design buildings to be, you know, if you have a very rare earthquake, to be, you know, to some extent disposable, um, although they probably shouldn't be. Um, then you have buildings that do well, perhaps lower level of shaking, and you have these uh, infill walls that are just kind of meant to be dividers. And these are two from hospitals, also in Chile, where you have walls damaged, uh, elevator equipment that's damaged, and it really puts the hospital out of operation. And this is what happened in, in Chile to a lot of the hospitals. Um, there was a large earthquake trick, a lot of, a lot of the, um, the country. Um, airports, you know, this is what two of the airports looked, looked like. I think it was there maybe about a week after. Um, the earthquake and you know and had just reopened it was out for a week uh, structurally it was fine but all the contents were were, were, uh, were torn apart and the and the whole terminal had to be closed now if we look at what it takes to actually construct a building about 
10 to 20% of that is the actual structural system, right? The rest of it, what I call the non-structural, or it could be the architectural finishes, the partition walls, et cetera, the contents, which could be, you know, hospital, we have a little higher content cost because of the MRI equipment and all these fancy machines that, you know, are needed for, for diagnosis and so forth. Uh, you know, contents are, are a much more significant part. But, you know, all these things are subjected to the earthquake shaking, and a lot of these things could be damaged during uh, the earthquake. So, um, one of the things we, that, you know, I've been looking at, it, it's not, I mean, I didn't invent it myself, it's not new, it's been around for maybe since like the, it's been around, the has been around for a long time, but maybe until the 80s, we've, we've actually got to the point where the technology can be implemented reliably in practice, and that is to add a very soft layer under a building such that when the earthquake comes, and you know, the earthquake comes, it's gonna wanna, you know, sweeps the building from the bottom, the building kind of, you know, sticking by its inertia, it wants to stay what it is, and it'll deform, right? And then you get the bending, columns crack, beams crack, everything inside gets rattled, and damage happens. Uh, if we have this very soft layer, it's kind of like, you know, if, it's kind of the effect of, you know, sweeping the, 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 the tablecloth under, under the dining table, everything kind of stays in place, right? Everything just kind of slides. Uh, you have the building just kind of sliding, and the building kind of stays where it is, and the whole building, you know, hopefully it doesn't move a whole lot, and nothing happens. This is the idea of seismic isolation. And um, it wasn't, again, you know, it's, it's, you know, you could probably date it back to um, the Greeks and so forth, but uh, it was not until, um, say, uh, 80s or so, maybe late 70s, 80s, that this technology was developed to the point where we could get devices that reliably could support a building under its own weight and provide some very flexible support. And one of these systems is this, um, what we call elastomeric bearing. They're altering layers of rubber and steel and sometimes there's a lead core in there to allow for, for greater energy dissipation to absorb a lot of the earthquake energy. Um, and these are very r rigid um, vertically to support the building, but very flexible, flexible in the horizontal direction. Right? And, the, and the vertical step this comes from these very thin layers of rubber. If you have one big piece of rubber, it probably just kind of squash under, under the weight of the building. Um, and this is actually some testing I was involved in. These are very small scale bearings, by the way. This is maybe about a six inch bearing. In practice, they're probably more like um, they could be 20, 30 inches or sometimes even, even bigger. Um, the other type of bearing that's been developed um, in, in the 80s was, and there's kind of variations of this now, but they're friction bearings. Basically, you know, now you have a building sliding under its foundation. It usually have a stainless steel surface, a very smooth surface, uh, with, the, with the slider, with the, with the Teflon coating that gives it a very low friction. They could get as low as 3%, but typically they're more like 6, 7% coefficient of, of, of a friction. Okay. So with these devices, we could put them under buildings um, and have what we call this base isolation effect. And there's been quite a few buildings in the U.S. that have this um, um, technology. And there was one even, a USC uh, hospital that was around during the time of the 1994 earthquake, got shaken up a bit. And, you know, this is um, a, a study done by the USGS, but it shows kind of the... the Earthquake input, if you notice, this is, uh, they're all acceleration records that were recorded during, um, during the earthquake, and this was an instrument to building, so we have this data available. And in the bottom, you see kind of what the earthquake, what the ground shook like, and then as you go up the building, you see that the amplitude has actually decreased. Typically, what we see in the fixed space building, right, without isolation, is you see an amplification, sometimes upward of a factor of three or four. So you see how it could reduce this, uh, this effect, right? And um, while I have this slide up, I'll just mention, you know, some of the things I've been working on on this area is um, how do these systems behave under large earthquakes? And I just kind of saw the opportunity to talk about this now, but, you know, you usually have this building, this, this isolation system in a basement, and as your uh, building begins to shake, you know, this is going to move back and forth, and you have these walls surrounding the structure. So if your displacements get large enough, you get to the point where you can start impacting, and then things could probably go uh, pretty bad. So these are, you know, some of the issues that I'll... I'll um, I may allude to later in terms of what needs to be done to further better understand these buildings. Um, in turn, you know, there's, there's, U, there's there, this USC hospital, and up to now, there's maybe about 300 isolated buildings in the U.S. Um, and the applications in the U.S. Are, have primarily been to hospitals, um, um, hospitals in California or in high seismic regions. There have been quite a number of applications to uh, historical structures such as um, San, Francisco, San Francisco City Hall, which had to be retrofitted because uh, it's in a high seismic zone, and if you were to get a fairly strong earthquake, it'll probably uh, take this building down. So, you know, buildings like this that are important or are critical or essential facilities 
um, these these types of buildings are being isolated, but your typical you know office building or um, even university building don't have um, don't have this treatment. And uh, one one thing I will mention from the slide is you know a big factor in this on why there's you know only specialized applications is because it costs maybe five to ten percent more of of the structural cost, which is you know small portion, although probably the overall cost of the project to implement this uh, technology. And it's only when owners really want it and demand it that it gets applied. If you look at Japan, you know, the, the track in Japan has been slightly different. Um, there's about 5,000 of these isolated buildings. They're looking at you know, app applying it to tall buildings, uh, single, single uh, home dwellings, office buildings, et cetera. And um, if you look at Japan, you know, Japan was kind of on track to where we were at. In 1994, we had the Northridge earthquake, right? That kind of didn't scare us enough, I guess. In 1995, Japan had the earthquake in Kobe about one year later. And since then, their application shot up, right? And, you know, there is, is a little, <coughs> probably a, perhaps a little different train of thought in Japan and the U.S. because that's a kind of a, a seismicity map of Japan. The U.S. one doesn't look as bad. So, so and, and, you know, this was a big earthquake. And since that one, you know, about the same time as we had our last, you know, major event, um, <coughs> they probably go back and uh, I could probably name three or four other ones that they had, including this recent 9.0. So, you know, that's perhaps one of the reasons why they're more, a little bit more active in, in implementing this technology. Um, China has also seen a significant increase in now, now about uh, 600 structures. Um, but, you know, they, they started, you know, a lot later than we did. And the US was actually one of the leaders in the, in the development of this technology. And now China has, you know, obviously surpassed us. They're building a lot more than we are. That's perhaps one of the reasons for, for that as well. Uh, so one of the problems then in, in this isolation is, you know, how come this technology isn't being used? And, you know, cost is one issue, but how can we get uh, building owners to kind of implement this technology a little bit more? And uh, there's been actually, I'll talk about two projects. Uh, one is one that I was involved in, and, you know, most of the work took place. I've been here one year, so... Uh, I haven't done at least any major tests while I've been here, but uh, but this was you know a lot of work took place while I was at Buffalo. But I was working with uh, uh, faculty from uh, from Reno and from uh, Berkeley on on this uh, on this fairly large project funded by the National National Science Foundation. And as part of that, I did some testing at Buffalo, looking at this with this impact uh, issue I mentioned before. But our our, our um, capstone test was this one that we did in Japan using um, what is the world's largest shape table. This is a big platform. Whenever there's an earthquake, we record the ground motion. We could take that acceleration. You know, and this table could do up to three components. It's actually a six-degree six freedom table. And we could reproduce you know, the Northridge earthquake, the Kobe earthquake, the recent uh, 2011 Japan earthquake, and so forth on this table. And so we, could, uh, we had a full-size building. Uh, so this is a full-scale full building, a steel frame building on this uh, isolation system. And some of these floors had some uh, non-structural, uh, they were outfitted with some you know, typical equipment you might find in, in buildings. So this is a, um, a video of the test. And you notice the table starts shaking underneath, much like the earthquake. And the building kind of just kind of rolls around and almost moves kind of like a rigid body, like a rigid box, right? So there's really, very little going on in, in the building um, itself. Um, Again, this was, uh, so this test was done in collaboration with, with, uh, with, with Japanese um, researchers because um, use of this facility is fairly uh, expensive. Um, so just to give you, you know, some views from the inside and, um, you know, just the, we threw some kind of some equipment together. So on, on the left, you see kind of that uh, rubber bearing and you see how it's kind of deforming and it's able to kind of still carry the load of the structure even though it's, you know, sometimes, um, you know, the, it could even take load if, if the top diameter kind of even overlaps its bottom diameter. Um, but um, uh, what these tests show is, you know, and what we're trying to do here is gain some, some um, quantitative data on how much better an isolated building can, can, um, can, um, can uh, or how much, by how much a, an isolated building can reduce damage compared to a fixed space or traditional building. And these are just kind of some plots showing, you know, one, one thing we want to look at is our acceleration. Because in terms of acceleration, you know, the contents inside the building, the force is proportional to acceleration. So uh, it's kind of a measure of how much damage you might expect in the building. And the black lines are their fixed space buildings 
the red and blue are cases of different types of isolation systems. One is this rubber bearing, the other one is, 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 a, is a slider type or a friction bearing. And you see how they could reduce, especially as you move up the stories, um, you could reduce uh, the demands in, in the building. Um, I also want to mention, uh, there was a recent project that just finished, and this is the one I think you're referring to. I think the test happened last May, so it happened right before I got here, and I was kind of, I wish I could have been here to see them. But it was a, a project taken on, by, taken on by three of my colleagues in, uh, in uh, structural engineering, uh, led by uh, Tara Hutchinson, um, who's a professor in our department. And in this test, they, they were also looking at a five-story concrete building. Um, but here, I think that this, this project was um, <coughs> particularly impressive because of you know, the care they took to kind of install the contents inside a building. They had a working elevator, um, you know, piping systems, hospital layout, one room was a hospital, one room was an office, one room was an apartment type uh, layout and so forth. And so it was pretty impressive in terms of looking at the content and then comparing the response of an isolated and a fixed space uh, building. So it's kind of hard to see, but there's a big concrete slab on the bottom. Under there, there's some, some isolation bearings, and they, and, and they did the test on isolated buildings, of course, because that one we thought was going to be safer. And then they took out the, the bearings and tested it, you know, assuming it was uh, tied to the ground. So this video, I couldn't quite get in my presentation because it's uh, maybe some Apple uh, uh, versus uh, Windows issues. Um, but this is a video. First, we'll look at the, at the, at the, at the base isolated uh, building configuration. And again, looking at, you know, isolated, first an isolated building and how the kind of the building moves when the ground starts shaking. And these tests took place here um, on uh, maybe about 15 minutes away. Off Highway 15, we have a, a, a lab out there that has one of these uh, shake table simulators. This would table is the largest in the US, um, the largest outdoor um, shake table. And you know, price and it was probably one of the only ones I could afford to do that. I don't think we could have done that in Buffalo. Um, but now this is now the kind of fixed space configuration under the same earthquake. So you kind of get the idea of how things begin to rattle around a lot more. And um, following this should be kind of a slightly stronger um, event. And you know, this table, you know, not that the weather had anything to do with it, was one of the reasons why you know I was so interested in coming to San Diego. Uh, because you know of the equipment like this and the tests that you know that can be done um, on um, on a table like this. So now the same building, looking at in a slightly larger um, ground motion. And this is when things begin to topple, and you know depending on some things, you might be able to kind of tip over. You know the fridge tips over; it may it could damage and may not work anymore. So you see kind of how the loss can start accumulating as you um, as you take on this uh, damage. I, I mean, I hate to do this, but I. Uh, and this project was funded mainly by the National Science Foundation. And what was unique about it, they had quite a lot of industry partners that helped to you know, set up the elevator. They actually also looked at fire effects following the earthquake. So the pretty, um, pretty um, comprehensive project, but I wanted to mention it uh, because of, uh, where do I want to go? I think there, yeah. Uh, because of, you know, this, this is a type of work that's going on in San Diego and very related to, um, to what I do. Uh, I should also mention in terms of equipment, the only machine that could test these bearing components themselves at full scale is here in, in, uh, in San Diego. So there were some you know, pretty neat results that also came out of this project in terms of you know, how contents behave under earthquake loading with and without this isolation device and data that will allow us to kind of quantify um, you know, how much better, how much can you save you know, in a scenario earthquake uh, from uh, considering with and without, an, uh, with and without uh, isolation. So you know, kind, of to kind of sum things up, um, I mean, we're seeing damage in recent earthquakes. We're seeing a lot, of, a lot of damage. But even if the building is fine, and as structural engineers, we focus on the structure for a very long time. But even if the structure is fine, we're finding that a lot, a lot of the losses are coming from content inside the building. And so one of the ways we could reduce you know, both actually structural and non-structural damage is by looking at this um, you know, advanced technology, seismic isolation. Um, and you know, I, for my work, I focus on this because it's you know, one of the most effective strategies. And you know, there's still a long way to go to get this implemented in practice. Uh, I looked at other uh, protective devices, you know, looking at even active actuation systems and so forth. But um, this is perhaps one of the most, you know, as a, for a passive system, one of perhaps one of the best ways uh, to go. And so I think there's a lot of work to be done to try to convince um, building owners, in particular, on, you know, when they're constructing a new building, to try to implement this technology. Um, and one of the ways to do this is, you know, perhaps looking at um, 
collecting data from past earthquakes. There's this one that I showed from uh, the USC hospital. There's a lot more data that came out of Japan after this recent earthquake. And also by doing these types of tests to better characterize and trying to understand how, and what we want to do eventually is try to quantify, you know, for a fixed space building and, 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 an, and an isolated building, you know, if this building were to be shaken, what would be the repair costs in, you know, assuming both cases. Um, and so we need kind of the data to try to be able to, to come up with the right numbers to, to do that. Um, so the issues are that, you know, convincing building owners and another thing is looking at how can we, um, how do these systems behave under extreme earthquakes? If you have an earthquake larger than the design basis, are this still, you know, will the building also collapse like a fixed space or what, what is, is the safety measures like if they begin to impact and so forth? And so these are some of the things that, that you know, as, as a researcher in this area, I'm, I'm uh, looking into. So with that, I'll all in your presentation. <clears throat> Any good questions for our speaker? No, about residential applications of these isolators. Is it really a question of convincing the owners or changing industry practices? Because nowadays, if you don't build something by two by fours and slab on grade, they just look at you with a yeah. look and say, what are you talking about? Yeah. So for residential, I mean, here it's, it's probably a little bit more, more, more challenging. And uh, I mean, the only th case I could think of in residential was you know, I think at Buffalo, we're testing some, um, hydro, some shock ups, kind of like what you would find in your car, these shock absorbers, dampers, in a, in a, in a wood frame building. And I think someone from um, Beverly Hills or somewhere called up and saw these are like, hey, you know what, I want these in my house. Uh, but other than that, I haven't heard of too many applications um, where this can be implemented for, because it, usually wood frame construction is not engineered construction. They follow the, you know, the two by four, like 16 and so forth, their typical guidelines. Um, we're, and wood houses, for the most part, are, are fairly good for earthquakes because they're, they're light. Um, what we're trying to focus on is the larger uh, buildings, uh, the multi-story buildings. Um, and there, I mean, these are, you know, especially when we start getting to you know, 10 stories or so, these tend to attract earthquake forces uh, quite a bit more depending on, you know, what region you're at and so forth. Um, and this is where, you know, where probably most of the buildings lie in, in this sort of mid-story range and where this technology could really be very, very effective. Um, I mean, there's, Japan, the Japanese are applying to tall 50-story buildings and there's some question as to how effective you get in that range, right? You get, getting a lot of swaying motion and so forth and it, you know, perhaps you could tear, pull up, tear, tear over one of the rubber bearings and so forth, but they're using it for, for many, different, uh, many different applications. Um, and your other point on, on, you know, the design standards also have a lot to do with it. Um, the U.S. has perhaps some of the most rigorous standards for designing these buildings. If you design a conventional building, there's kind of a set process. If you want a fixed isolated building, you've got to go through these extra hoops because at the time it was first implemented, you know, people were like, oh, you know, I'm not sure how to do this. So there's a lot of these little extra hoops that you have to go through the, in the design process. Um, that have also hampered their design. It would actually take more time because you got to do additional testing and so forth. So that's another issue we're looking at too. Quick last question. Uh, any comments about the uh, lifetime of the bearings uh, in the context of say ozone, air pollution in an urban environment and can they still be, uh, are they still functional after they've gone through an earthquake? You know, what's, what's their durability? These are very functional in terms of, of surviving after an earthquake, that question I can answer with, with a lot of certainty because when we test in, in our lab, when we do these shake table tests and we test a fixed space building, we could test it once. When we tested these isolated buildings, I ran these bearings through, the same pair of bearings through like 50 um, Northridge earthquakes or even higher than that. So in terms of the repetition, they're, they're actually very great. The durability, I cannot answer that question with so much confidence. But these bearings have been around for maybe, you know, the earlier applications were like in 19, um, 1980s. And so this is something we're still studying where a lot of these isolated buildings, when they were initially designed, this was a concern. So they have, um, they, they, um, they manufacture some extra bearings. And what they've been doing every 10 years is they take a bearing out, kind of swap it out. Uh, they take the, the old one that's been in under compression mode of a building and they tested it. And so far they've done fairly well. I mean, the, the change in properties is, 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 I would say, you know, if you want a percentage, five, 10% or so. So overall, I mean, what we've seen to date, they're, they're still fairly, fairly reliable.
Thank you very much.